This is George Wallace, a man on the move, a man who many believe will be our next president. What do you know about him? How does he stand on Vietnam, on law and order, on local controls of schools and labor unions? What about the national magazine stories on him? Is he as good as his supporters say? During the next 30 minutes, you will have an opportunity to judge for yourself as Governor Wallace discusses some of the major issues facing our nation today. Governor Wallace has gained a wide recognition among friend and foe alike as a man who is not afraid to speak his mind or take a stand. No one questions his courage or his style of letting the political chips fall where they may. I don't think it's a question of courage, it's more a question of honesty. We in this region have always said openly and forthrightly that we thought local control of the public school system uh, was best for everyone concerned. But we've never attempted to tell people in California, New York, or any other state how they should run their schools. We feel that schools are a local democratic institution, local situations prevail, and people in each state uh, should know best how to run their own schools. And for this, we've been called racist. Now, I personally consider a racist someone who doesn't like a person because of their color. I believe there's a supreme being who made all of mankind, and he loves all mankind. And I'm not, I'm not against anybody because of color, and I never have been. And I've never made a speech in my life that reflected on anybody because of race, color, creed, religion, or national origin. little man You're the best hope we've had since George Washington Listen hawks Listen dogs We gotta give little George a show Stand up for America, little man. You're saying what the others would say if they had the guts to stand. Listen, blacks. Listen, whites. Stand for the man that stands for the right Let's make a resolution To save our Constitution He's the people's man Let's give Yeah, no man is for the black And the red, white, and blue He's got a steel bone in his back Stand up for America, little man If you can't be president, we'll all be Alabama bound. Listen, rich, listen, poor. Let's put little George inside the White House door.
This is the enthusiastic reception that is being given America's Governor George C. Wallace for president. Astute political observers and veteran newsmen in all parts of the nation are now acknowledging that when most of the names being tossed around in headlines today have fallen by the wayside, the Wallace campaign will still be growing strong and pointing toward the climactic November general election. During the next half hour, you will hear recorded highlights of speeches that Governor George C. Wallace has made in appearances from coast to coast. This is a special report to give you an up-to-the-moment report on the Wallace campaign and to allow Governor Wallace to express his sincere appreciation for the help that thousands and thousands of persons are giving his candidacy for president. He has made the pledge that he will campaign in all parts of the nation to discuss the issues facing our country and to outline in depth his plans to answer these problems. Millions of Americans share with you and with Governor Wallace the concern about the over-centralization of government in Washington and the continued breakdown of law and order. With your continued support and backing, Governor Wallace can and will win in November. Here, Governor Wallace attacks those liberals who talk about free choice but do not give the people a chance to speak. And we hear these liberals on some college campuses and in some pulpits and some newspaper editor's offices and on some judges' benches say, let the people speak. We believe that people ought to choose. They ought to have the right to say what they want to do and where they want to go. And so we had that system of schooling in Alabama. But they filed a suit in 1966 in which the Justice Department said, not enough people on this side of Atlanta have chosen to go to school on this side of Atlanta. Not enough people on this side of El Monte, California have decided to go to school on this side of El Monte, California. Not enough people have chosen on this side of Montgomery, Alabama to go on this side and not enough on this side to go on this side. And we said, well, they could have chosen if they had desired to choose. What are we going to do about it? And you know what Mr. Ramsey Clark's Justice Department answered? They said, that's your problem. That's your problem. You work it out. You either get them to choose correctly, or we're going to choose for them. So I say that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and the other federal judges who in the beginning said they believed in free choice didn't tell the truth because they believe in free choice only. If you choose like they think you ought to choose, so they're not really for free choice, and they've now destroyed free choice and said, we're going to choose for your child, and that a parent has no inalienable right to the choice of what school his child happens to attend. Governor Wallace believes that education and relocation of industry and business throughout our nation can solve many of the problems facing the United States today. Another issue that confronts the American people is a matter of breakdown of law and order. There is no reason under the sun that gives anyone in this country the right to destroy the internal security of these United States and 200 odd million people's safety. I tell you who's responsible for the breakdown of law and order. It's a very few people, and I'm not talking about race. The overwhelming majority of citizens, black, white, red, and yellow in this country, and any other race, are against this breakdown of law and order just the same as those of us who assemble here tonight. Those who bring about the breakdown of law and order are militants, activists, revolutionaries, anarchists, and communists. That's who brings about the breakdown of law and order. And the President's, the President's Crime Commission report says we must pay a ransom to keep our country from being burned down. How you know they're not going to burn it down if you pay them the ransom? And so they recommend that your taxes, the working man's taxes in Georgia, be raised 50 to 100 percent in order to pay people not to work. And who, th who thinks up all these ideas of paying people not to work and raising your taxes? It's some of these multi-billion dollar tax-exempt foundations who, when they raise your taxes with these schemes, they don't pay any because they are tax exempt. So I say that if this is such a good idea, 
Let these multi-billion dollar foundations like Rockefeller, Ford, Mellon, and Carnegie put up their billions of dollars the first year, and if it's good, we'll do it. And if it's such a good idea, we taxpayers may consider looking after it the second year, but let them pay for it the first year. But when you talk about that, and some of them talk about poverty, and I reckon they like poverty because they never had any of it when they were a boy. But anyway, I'm for the elimination of poverty, and we must work toward helping people regardless of their race in this matter. But we must do it by tax incentives to industry, to build branch plants away from the great metropolitan areas, such as those on the eastern seaboard. Not that we must take anything out of Chicago or Philadelphia or Atlanta, but we must build industries in the rural sections of our nation in order that all people might not find it necessary to go to the large metropolitan areas to earn a living, because many of them are not equipped. And one reason many of these people have gone has been because of the hypocrisy of political leaders in those sections who have said everything is so bad in Georgia, everything so bad in Alabama, everything so bad in Mississippi, and now they have helped to dislocate population in our country by false promises. We can solve poverty in this country through education and through an expansion of the free enterprise system which has alleviated more, proper, more poverty than all the government handout programs that I can think of. So these are some things that we want to do that are real and ought to have been done a long time ago. But get back to the matter of the breakdown of law and order. If you walk out of this building tonight and somebody knocks you in the head, the person who knocks you in the head is out of jail before you get in the hospital, and on Monday morning they'll try the policeman about it if you don't watch out. Governor Wallace has no time for those radicals who would impair the safety of the president. And today we find unsafety on the streets of our cities because you cannot convict a criminal. And we find it unsafe for working men to have their wives to ride the transit system or to go to the supermarket. And I'm talking about people of all races it's unsafe for. And yet, even political leaders have been assassinated in our country. Here, Governor Wallace renews his pledge to work for all the people of our nation. We have had support from people in our state of all races and colors and creeds and religions and national origins. And I have never in my life made a speech, nor have I'm sure any of you, that reflected on anyone because of who they happen to be. We are not like the liberals in the country, or some of the liberals rather, who think their minds are the greatest things in the universe. We realize that God made all mankind of all colors. And to despise anyone because of color or race is to despise the handiwork of God. But you know what they say when we talk about local government, when we talk about the property ownership system and free enterprise system, the liberals and the left wingers try to write us off by saying we are racist, our hate mongers are fascists, and we are neither one. We are not racist, hate, or fascist. So, I want to see problems in this country that government ought to try to solve, solve for all of our people. And we are not against that at all. And we are not running against anybody because of who they happen to be, but we are running in defense of a philosophy that made our country great that's under attack today. Governor Wallace calls for the return of local institutions to local people. I don't recommend any sort of school system for the people of Houston, Texas nor the state of Texas, nor Concord, California, nor Escanaba, Michigan. I only recommend that the people of those states and those areas decide themselves what they consider to be in the interest of their own child or grandchild. And when has it got to be the time in our country that no one has any integrity or morality or ability to choose except some bureaucrat with a pointed head who can't even park a bicycle straight on a college campus? H-E-W, the Health Education and Welfare Department, 
They are spending millions of dollars checking on the schools in Houston, the schools in Los Angeles and in Chicago, and they're checking on shower baths and the industries and restroom facilities, millions of dollars. Well, the HEW works under the executive branch of the government, and all these brief toting uh, 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 HEW workers that have swarmed over this country costing millions of dollars, when I get to be the president, I'm going to recall every one of them to Washington, and I'm going to throw their briefcases in the Potomac River. It might pollute the river, but we'll take that chance. So, one of the issues is return domestic democratic institutions to the people of the states. We're going to turn back your schools. We're going to turn back your hospitals. We're going to turn back the seniority and apprenticeship list to the local labor unions and let you decide those matters for yourself. We're going to turn the reapportionment of the legislatures of the states and the redistricting of congressional districts back to the people of the states. You know, I mentioned a moment ago about choosing properly. You know, over in your neighboring state of Oklahoma, the people voted on the apportionment of their legislature. They said, we want a legislature in this way, in this manner, and they went to the polls and voted. But the Supreme Court of our country said, you can't vote like that. You voted wrong, and they struck it down. So when they say, let the people speak one man, one vote, they really didn't mean it because when the people voted, they said you didn't vote right. And over in California, they voted four and one half million to two million on the matter of disposing of their private property and their own homes in the manner in which the property owner wanted to dispose. What did the Supreme Court say? They said, you Californians voted wrong and struck it down. You didn't vote right. If you had voted the other way, it had been all right. And I'm tired of one federal judge in the state of Texas, and one federal judge has more power and authority than all the people of Texas, the governor of Texas, and the legislature of Texas combined. And I'm tired, I'm tired of the non-elected. <laughs> I'm tired of the non-elected branch of the government of the United States doing what Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln said it was going to do, destroy individual liberty and freedom in this country because they and their Godly wisdom think they, their notions are what the law ought to be and is what they write instead of what the law happens to be. And I'm tired of the Supreme Court of the United States running over the people of Texas, California, and Alabama, and we're going to put a stop to it one of these days. You know, they've even gotten into such things as can't even say a simple prayer in a public school. They say it's unconstitutional. Well, I'm for separation of church and state, but separation of God and state are entirely two different matters. So, so they say, and now little children in lunch rooms throughout the country in public orphanages are not even allowed to kneel and say the little prayer. Now they've been down to sleep because it violates, they say, the decision of the courts. And in school lunch rooms throughout the country where public funds are involved, they've held that as a result of this decision that little children cannot even bow their heads and say, God is great, God is good. It violates the Constitution, they say. Well, who ever heard of any such interpretation of the Constitution of our country? Those are the things that the average man in this country is sick and tired of. And it's going to be the average man, the man on the street is going to turn back government to the people and take it away from the pseudo-intellectual cult that tries today to write every guideline involving all of our lives. Millions of Americans in all parts of the nation are rallying to the exciting leadership offered by Governor George C. Wallace, a presidential candidate who tells it like it is. If you are tired of being the forgotten man, if you are tired of our national leaders apologizing for every American act, if you are tired of elected leaders giving away millions of dollars to countries who then turn around and trade with countries who are killing American boys, if you want law and order to return to our cities instead of bowing to the blackmail of those who would kill or burn, 
then Governor George C. Wallace is your man. Remember, he needs your help now. From New York to California, I know there's others just like me. They're hard-working people that love being free. And there's things we'd like to say, and we're seeking a better way. We're just little men needing a good friend. We need someone to say what we want to say. And I heard it on the radio. They've walked upon the moon And sailed among the stars But the big men are not wise enough To know where the little men are We'd like to speak the way we feel but so far, we got a raw deal We're just little men Needing a good friend The presidential campaign of Governor Wallace is meeting with success in every part of our nation. What is behind this success? His candor and forthrightness in discussing the issues facing our nation openly and honestly. His proven abilities and record of achievement in all three branches of government, executive, administrative, and judicial. His pledge to return direction and control of local domestic institutions like schools, hospitals, and labor unions to local people instead of centralizing them in Washington. His knowledgeable concern and insight into our foreign aid programs and our foreign policies, especially the Mideast and Southeast Asia. These are some of the reasons why millions of Americans just like you are looking to George C. Wallace. In the weeks and months ahead, Governor Wallace will continue to be a man on the move, taking his campaign directly to the people. While other candidates may sit on the political fence, straddling the issues or refusing to comment at all, millions of Americans already know and millions more will come to find out that Governor George Wallace is not afraid to speak out on the issues. Millions of Americans know that our nation's leadership has failed Violence and anarchy and criminality are commonplace. Our streets have become unsafe for political leaders and, just as importantly, are unsafe for the average American citizen going about his everyday task of working to provide for his family and his loved ones. Many of the trends present in the government today foment violence, encourage anarchy, breed criminals and threaten to destroy our freedom and encourage the use of violence as a political weapon. Underlying and encouraging this trend in every way exists a continuing conspiracy to gain world domination by the worldwide movement of communism. I want to say, I want to and thank, this condition course, uh, will continue to grow the worse. The answer to all of this lies, of course, in obedience to the law, the in the ability of our police at all levels to enforce the law without interference of do-good judges whose decisions are wrecking our freedom. We must give our police the power necessary to enforce the law. Following that, we must ensure that courts are not allowed to destroy the security of our country 
by and liberal left-wing decisions that have no Iraq basis in Alabama. true constitutional law. It would not have been Millions of Americans know and that I Governor Wallace, in stating these words, family, is telling it like it is. So much Although primarily still restricted to ballot position campaigns on a state-to-state basis, Governor Wallace is already victory. registering and, uh, very strongly in national polls and surveys being Alabama conducted across the nation. To have As more and more Americans have the opportunity to see and hear Governor Alabamians. Wallace, his presidential preference well, will continue to folks. rise. The Buster boys, uh, the traveling crew, just the Alabamian in general, and Jimmy Velvet and his wife Kathy, who came down to help us I want to thank them. Uh, as you know, they are a celebrated artist in their own right from Huntsville, Alabama. And so Jimmy and Kathy, where are you all? Thank you very much. Here. But, <laughs> and so I would also like to say that the race is over for governor of Alabama. And that, as I said, when I lost the governor's race, in 1958 that I would join with Governor John Patterson in trying to do what I could as an individual to make Alabama one of the finest states in the Union. And so I would ask all of those in Alabama who had a right uh, to select your candidate to now join with me and with those who supported me to work to have four fine four years of progressive uh, government in Alabama and peace and tranquility and to uh, do those things that government ought to do to benefit all the people of our state regardless of who they happen to be. Of course I'm very humble and, humble and proud of the outcome of the election and my thanks to the people of Alabama who I know knew uh, in the final analysis would stand with us in our cause. And uh, I again want to emphasize that they know the importance of this election, not only at the local level, uh, but as it will affect those matters that affect Alabamians from the national level. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Yes, sir, Chuck. Governor, Governor uh, what are your national political plans? I have no national political plans at all at this time. I have plans only to serve as governor of Alabama uh, to institute some of the progressive measures that we uh, advocated during the campaign for governor. My whole thought at this time is to make Alabama a fine, active governor during the next four years. But that the <laughs> I, I do recognize that having been elected governor of Alabama, that uh, my being in the governor's office of Alabama places me in a position to speak not only for Alabamians, for, but for people of our region, the South, about the public school system. And I do feel that my being governor will exert pressure on the administration in Washington toward returning, at least through freedom of choice, uh, the schools to the people of the respective states. And uh, so when you say national plans, I have no national plans, but I do plan to put into existence some of the programs uh, that I recommended to the people of Alabama doing the race for governor. Governor, uh, <coughs> governor Brewer said last night that this was the dirtiest campaign he'd ever seen, that race was the issue, that you and your people had raised it. Uh, to what extent do you agree with this, and to what extent do you think people... Race was not an issue in the campaign for governor. You gentlemen who are here today heard me in every speech that I made. I have never reflected upon anybody because of who they happen to be. But block voting, yeah, it was an issue. And that's entirely different from race. It just so happened that uh, the black militant leaders in Alabama voted uh, all of the votes of the members of that race, which in my judgment takes away their individualism and uh, after getting the right of franchise, then takes it away from them again. And so, well, I'm, I don't know whether you'd call it a, a, a the, the term white backlash is a, a journalistic uh, 
expression coined by you folks in, in journalism. There is a backlash against block voting, but not against people because of race. The people of this state are not against people because of who they happen to be as far as race is concerned, and I hope that'll always be the case. And I didn't say one word in my campaign for governor that would have embarrassed any citizen of Alabama because of who they happen to be. And the only, the block voting issue was injected by the block vote leaders themselves, who said prior to May 5th, we will elect the next governor of Alabama. They injected that issue. And then when boxes come in 3,762 for my opponent and zero for me, and 2,521 for my opponent and one for me, then they injected that issue. And it became an issue, and I would say that uh, this ought to prove to people who vote in Alabama that they should exercise their right to vote as individuals and not as a block on racial grounds. And so race was not an issue. It was an issue of block voting, and they are entirely two different matters. Governor, yes, sir, Don. Governor, if the federal government does not respond or listen to your message on freedom of choice and local control. Are you leaving the door open to running for president in 72 if you don't get the kind of response you want? Well, let, let me say this. I have no plans. I expect to serve four years as governor of Alabama, but I'm going to be in a position, in my judgment, to exercise some political pressure, not me as an individual, as George Wallace, but as governor of Alabama. I will be representing millions of people in this state and other states. And as you national columnists have stated, many of you, and many of you have written, that my defeat for governor would mean that the Nixon administration would turn away from our part of the country and would forget its southern strategy, but that my election as governor would force them in the direction of implementing the southern strategy. And I believe that my election as governor of Alabama is going to mean that the administration recognizes that they cannot win without carrying the South in the next election. And therefore, that even lessens the chances of participation in national politics because we will have achieved our goals through this method of my being elected governor of Alabama. Uh, so uh, let's just wait and see if they respond. Uh, the national columnists and you national news uh, media uh, representatives and commentators, I think, have commented along the same line that I have commented already. And I frankly think it's going to have a healthy effect for the people of our part of the country. It's going to say to the administration in Washington that the people of the South have spoken. They just want the commitments made by the administration in Washington to return our school system to control at least through freedom of choice. I want to again emphasize that I believe that it's an absolute right of a state to run her school system in any manner she sees fit. But Mr. Nixon promised in his campaign for the presidency that he would return freedom of choice. He was quoted by Senator Strom Thurmond. They ran television ads all during the campaign in the South, that Mr. Nixon is for freedom of choice also. <clears throat> Vote for Mr. Nixon. He made a speech in Charlotte, North Carolina, in which he said that he believed in the neighborhood school concept. He didn't believe in closing schools. He didn't believe in arbitrarily taking money away from a state through HEW regulations. And he did not believe in busing students. But come this September, students are going to be bused all over the South, as they are even now being bust. So I'm going to ask the president of our nation, as the governor-elect, will you please carry out the commitment that you made to the people of our country? And I have confidence in the word of the president at this time. I want to see him a great president, because that's good for our country. And if they want to undercut me and get me out of the way, they can do that because that's what I want them to do. 
because then they would have satisfied the people of Alabama and the people of the South. But the people of the South are tired of being treated one way and people treated differently in other parts of the country, especially in view of our public school system. Governor, yes, uh, are you saying that you are going to <coughs> superimpose yourself on the administration of Governor Brewer between now and the time you take office? Do I plan to superimpose myself on the administration of Governor Brewer? Between now and the time you take office. Now, when you mean superimpose, you mean try to be involved in, in running the state, doing the, uh, uh, is that, uh, and, and the, and make, give me a right question. Give me, give me a question in Alabama language. Now, that superimpose. <laughs> Nelson, that superimposed got me. Are you going to let uh, Governor Brewer do the talking for Alabama between now and January, or are you going to, sir? Listen, God, I will speak as the governor-elect. The nomination is tantamount to election, as all governors elected do prior to their inauguration. But Governor Brewer is the governor of Alabama under the Constitution of our state, and he will be governor until I am inaugurated. And I certainly would in no manner try to uh, infringe upon the prerogatives of the governor of Alabama. No, he will be governor and speak as governor from now until I'm inaugurated. I can speak and express my viewpoint about matters prior to my inauguration, but in no manner would I try to uh, take over, so to speak, is the implication of your question because he is the governor of Alabama at this time and will be until January 1971. Governor, you uh, did not run as strongly this year as you had in the past in Alabama, and particularly in your own home county of Barber, you ran substantially behind another Barber County candidate, Mr. Beasley. Well, now you say substantially behind. I ran about four or five hundred votes behind, and you know when you've been governor two or three times, they're always... Uh, uh, you naturally have people that uh, don't support you because of positions you've taken. But I got more votes in Barber County than I ever got in my life before. I had never gotten as many votes as I got. Governor, that, yeah, and, that's uh, a thin edge, and I wonder whether you don't think you've grown away from the home folks a little bit. No, sir, I'm not growing. I don't know. That's uh, seemed to me when you've been elected governor of Alabama and you go back to one little county, I got more votes in Barber County, Alabama, than I ever got in my life. I got 300 votes more than I, my top vote as a candidate for governor of Alabama. It so happens we had a larger block vote in Barber County than we ever had before. Uh, and uh, they voted solidly against me uh, for governor Brewer. And that's where the fact that there were more votes cast against me, in fact, in the primary in 1966, almost as many votes were cast against my wife as there were against me. In fact, about the same number. But I received 300 votes more in Barber County than I ever got in any political campaign in the county. So it seems to me that I gained in Barber County, but the block vote gained, and they were larger and voted against me. Governor. But, <clears throat> Governor, I'm sorry, sir. Yes, sir. What are you going to do if uh, President Nixon doesn't return to schools to <sighs> control and buses uh, people all over the state and all over the South? Uh, well, Chuck, what are you going to do about we'll get, uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. I have every confidence that when a man who is the President of the United States stands before the American people and says, I'm against certain policies, I believe that he will try to carry out his commitment. Has he done that? I before? cannot, uh, he, so far, he's been president only a year and three months, and he's had the Vietnam War hanging heavily upon his shoulders, and that is certainly a heavy burden for any man to bear. But I hope he's successful in bringing that matter to a successful conclusion, but he's been there just a year in about three months. So I am confident that he will carry out that commitment this year and will carry it out maybe in a more expedient and earlier fashion, uh, my having been elected governor of Alabama. 
So let me say that I believe that the President of the United States, when he stands up and makes a statement to the American people, that he will get around to implementing that statement. Do, do you ever see a, a gubernatorial contest in this state without the racial issue? Did I ever see a gubernatorial contest? Do you foresee a time when a man can run for governor in this state and win without raising a racial issue? Well, in the first place, I did not raise it. I want to impress upon you newsmen that Joe Reed <coughs> is something that's, I hope you'll, I hope you'll understand, I didn't raise that issue. Joe Reed said in the beginning of the campaign, we, and he called the name, uh, the headline in the papers was we. The black people of Alabama would elect the next governor and the other officials of the state. He, he raised the issue himself. I didn't raise it at all. And I didn't run on race. And I want you to know that I I hope God blesses all the people of this state, black and white, during the next four years. Governor, Governor, if you have to, if you feel you have to, will you run for president? If I feel that I have to. You're asking a highly hypothetical question, Chuck. It's a long time off, and we'll have to wait to see what events transpire between now and then. And whether I ever become involved in national politics again, other than exerting the pressure uh, of governor, representing millions of people and telling the president of our nation that we do represent millions and we want you to think about us because the South has been mistreated about the public schools and about their children. And we are tired of being mistreated. We're tired of being treated here and having the president say de facto can exist in the East, but can't exist down south. And so anything that I did in that regard would depend in the future upon the, the desire of the people of Alabama. And it would be very easy for one who is governor of the state to know whether or not the people wanted me to be involved again. And that would all depend upon what takes place between now and 1972. And in my judgment, my election as governor lessens the chances of my being involved because I feel that Mr. Nixon now is going to implement his Southern strategy and he's going to try to woo the people of the South, which is exactly what I want him to do. But he cannot woo the South by, by platitudes and by making uh, nice expressions. We must see some action. And my friends, uh, what could be fairer than the federal government to return at least freedom of choice? to the public school systems of Alabama and the South, and I again emphasize that it ought to be completely in control of the people of the South and of Alabama and the state. But that's at least because he promised that. And all I'm saying is that I believe at this time that the President of the United States will honor his commitment. I don't believe the President of our nation will make a commitment and not try to honor it. And I would call upon him in the future to support the Whitten Amendment and defeat the Scott Amendment and let the American Congress himself pass a National Freedom of Choice uh, Act, which will be the first step in the eventual obtaining the right to run the schools in our states as we see fit. Governor Wallace, would you Governor, would you yes. what happens to the Wallace Movement and Box 72? Will you shut down those offices or will they keep going? Oh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, what we do about our offices, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have plenty of places for you to come to see me. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I said in the context of that statement, I believe that we will reopen the schools, but I also, you didn't get my full statement was that because my election as governor would impress upon Mr. Nixon that he would not destroy the neighborhood school concept, which is closing schools, he would not bust school students, and that he would not arbitrarily take money away from the school districts because of regulations that went beyond the law issued by Mr. Finch. I said, I believe as governor of Alabama and as governor, these schools will be open because I believe Mr. Nixon 
will carry out his commitment. And his commitment was that he was not going to do that. And that was in the context. I am not advocating the defiance of anything. I'm not advocating the defiance of law or court orders. I'm advocating only that the law be complied with and that Mr. Nixon carry out his commitment that he made to us as a candidate for president. Well, well Governor, uh, uh, a lot of what you're talking about in uh, freedom of choice and uh, de facto and uh, whatnot, uh, uh, the Nixon administration is bounded by a Supreme Court decision. The, the Supreme Court has never said that a national freedom of choice law was unconstitutional. And they have even ruled that freedom of choice was unconstitutional. They just said that some of the freedom of choice plans in the South uh, kept the, uh, a, a dual school system. It's nothing but a hypocritical statement by the court uh, which justifies uh, separation of some school systems in the North and not in the South. And when the courts issued those statements, they, it was hypocrisy on their part but they have never said that a national freedom of choice law was unconstitutional. And in my judgment, when the people of this country become so uh, aware of what's been taken away from them in that regard, that that's going to have even an impression upon the courts. Mr. Nixon could get freedom of choice, and the American Congress could get it, and it would stand up in the courts. They haven't held that unconstitutional at all. Governor, are you going to do anything between now and school? opening in the fall to uh, organize other southern governors or uh, general pressure to get the witness? I don't have any plans at this time to organize anything. I think my election as governor of Alabama indicates the uh, dissatisfaction in the other southern states. And in my judgment, <laughs> in my judgment, my election as governor is all going to organize some politicians in other parts of the south to speak out. We've heard some speaking now in Florida and other states that spoke a little differently than they used to speak, and that's because the people are upset from Miami to Richmond. So I frankly think that my election sort of organizes uh, and gives heart uh, to those in our part of the country who want our school system back, and they want it back under a so-called freedom of choice plan. I again emphasize I think it ought to be completely in the hands of the states, but the federal government ought to go at least that far because a commitment was made. Governor, you said the president can't win the South with platitudes. Are you talking about the vice president's speeches or, or just what? When I don't ask the question, over. You said that the president cannot woo the South with platitudes. With platitudes. Are you talking about Mr. Agnew? Yes, when Mr. Agnew, and we appreciate what he says, he's saying some things about some of the news media that uh, I used to say. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I had my funny line for you last night, but uh, I said if I had come before you having lost the governor's race, I wouldn't have you to kick around anymore. But uh, I'm talking about he can't say I'm against busing and keep on busing. Uh, people like to hear him say that. The president of the United States says I'm against busing. But if you keep on busing, people can understand words and action. We Southerners know that you can't say one thing and do another, so we like what they are saying. But now the next step in our political pressure plan from the South is to make them put into action that which they speak by their mouths. Norman. Governor Wallace, uh, this, is a, this is an old What's that, Jim? You want to come back to Alabama? <laughs> Ain't you glad I'm elected? <laughs> you know, a lot of these news men, I see the Atlanta Constitution's here today. Reg, I'm glad to see you. I recognize you, y'all, that endorsed my opponent. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I see it in good humor. You know, with all the things you folks have said about me, uh, yeah, I think it's marvelous that I'm in good humor. <laughs> In fact, uh, I heard a lot about smear during the campaign. A lot of, a lot of you people uh, have smeared me from heck to breakfast, as I said, <laughs> and all the way from Maine to California. But I can stand the hot grease, and I'm still in the kitchen. <laughs> and uh, Jim, you know, the New York Times, if I wasn't around, you'd have to hunt up some other copy. Hey! 
And uh, you see, the Atlanta Constitution, I give them two things to talk about, me and Governor Maddox, too. <laughs> Just suppose we were both out of the way. <laughs> No, but if uh, when I get to be governor, if you've got any news racks in the state capitol, I might move them out. 